Okay, good, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. You're all very welcome to this uh, Human Rights Centre discussion uh, this afternoon. Sort of grandiose title, uh, a conversation about the future of human rights in the UK. I'd just like to point out before we start that there are fire Brexits or exits, one here and one here. And also just to let you know that we are actually filming proceedings today. We're filming the speakers so that you're, you're all aware of that and happy enough with that. Um, in terms of uh, the discussion and the conversation, I think that the aim very much in the title is to have a relatively relaxed, as relaxed as any of these things can ever be, uh, discussion about some of the things that are happening uh, right now with reflection on the current situation and what each of our speakers think about what's happening right now, but also with some personal reflections on ways forward as well as to what might happen next. You know, I only need to point out uh, that dreaded word Brexit, but also uh, the Human Rights Act debate that's happening right now. I think a number of us have also heard the recent references that have been made uh, in relation to human rights lawyers, for example, and some of the implications of the rhetoric around this debate too, but also uh, pro the fact that progress is stalled on many of human, the human rights and equality issues here right now too. So I think there's a lot to think about and a lot to talk about to what's happening now and ways forward for the future. We should have time at the end of all this for a conversation, perhaps even a civic dialogue in the room about what we might uh, do next. I've asked each speaker to speak for a maximum of around 20 minutes. They'll each speak consecutively, I hope, but if there are, if there's one or two burning questions after each speaker, uh, we can ask those then, I think would be fair. So um, without further ado, our first speaker is Dr. Rachel Killeen from the Human Rights Centre in the School of Law. Her work is on responses to international crimes and mass human rights violations. She has recent publications on lawyers and truth recovery in South Africa, as well as procedural justice in international cr criminal courts, for example, her work on Cambodia. She's going to speak today to us about the question, where next for abortion rights in Northern Ireland. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Rachel. Before I do that, I thought it would be helpful to briefly outline what we're talking about when we talk about abortion rights and also to give an overview of the current legal framework in Northern Ireland. So we find the language of human rights is often used when we discuss abortion. Um, the rights to family life, to privacy, to health care, to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment and even to life are cited by advocates on both sides of the debate as well as the number of moral rights which are invoked by this kind of emotive discussion. It's therefore worth considering what kind of human rights framework is applicable when we discuss abortion and to what extent this right to abortion has received legal recognition. So the first thing we have to note is that in terms of international human rights law, there's not a generally recognized right to abortion, and nor is there consensus on the right to which fetal rights, the rights of unborn children, should be protected. However, the UN Human Rights Committee, which monitors state implementation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, has repeatedly criminal, uh, criticized the criminalization of abortion. And it's been joined in that by the Committee for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women and the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. And they've called on states to withdraw punitive sanctions imposed on people who access abortion and to ensure access to lawful abortion. In terms of what that access should actually look like, it seems that international human rights standards have developed to a place where states are obliged to ensure access to abortion, at least in cases where the pregnant person's life or physical and mental health is at risk, and in cases of severe fetal impairment, or where pregnancy is a result of a sexual crime. So the UN Human Rights Committee has found that denying access to abortion in these circumstances can constitute a violation of the human right to privacy and to health, 
as well as potentially a violation of the right to be free from torture and other ill treatment. Indeed, earlier this year, the committee ruled that the Republic of Ireland's law prohibiting and criminalising abortion violates the human rights of a woman who had a diagnosis of fetal, fatal fetal impairment. Northern Ireland's specific framework has also been recently criticised by the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, who expressed concerns that girls were unable to access safe abortion and post-abortion post care services and called on the UK government to decriminalise abortion. So it can be seen that while there's no general right, there's a recognition internationally that denying individuals access to abortion can, in certain circumstances, constitute a violation of human rights. Now, more regionally, within the European Human Rights Framework, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe has found that the decision on whether or not to have an abortion should be for the individual concerned and has called on the Council of Europe to allow for freedom of choice. At the European Court of Human Rights, the situation is more conservative and there's been a reluctance to interpret the Convention as conferring this general right of abortion. However, the Court has found that the prohibition of abortion, when sought for reasons of health or well-being, can fall within Article 8, which is the right to one's private life. It's also found that when states do legalise abortion, then they're under an obligation to ensure a framework exists which enables a pregnant person to effectively access information and healthcare in order to exercise those rights. Indeed, the Article 3 right to be free from inhuman and degrading treatment can be violated when individuals are blocked from obtaining legal abortion services. So the court's taking this on a case-by-case -case approach, and that's because of the absence of a common approach amongst the member states. So rather than make this clear finding on the right to abortion, what it does is at, kind of assess the national legal remedies as applied to individual cases, and then determine whether a fair balance has been struck between the individual rights and the public interest. So turning to the law in Northern Ireland, as I'm sure you're aware, the legal framework is more restrictive in, in the rest of the UK. So the Offences Against the Person Act 1861 made it a criminal offence to administer a poison or other noxious thing or unlawfully use an instrument to procure a miscarriage. And this applies to the provider and to the pregnant person, and that applies throughout the UK. However, in 1967, Westminster passed an abortion act which makes it legal to carry out abortions up to the 24-week limit on grounds of health and even beyond that where the pregnant person's health is threatened or there's a substantial risk the baby will have serious disabilities. To date, that act has not been extended to Northern Ireland and the only exception to the prohibition of abortion is in cases where a pregnant person's life is at risk or if there's a permanent or serious risk to the pregnant person's mental or physical health. So this legal framework is one of the most restrictive in Europe and it carries the most severe criminal penalty in abortion regulation in Europe with a potential life sentence. So to turn to one of, the one of the first kind of critical junctures that I mentioned at the start of this talk, it's worth noting that this system has been declared incompatible with European Convention rights by the Northern Irish High Court, and that's following a challenge that was brought by the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission last year. So the court examined international human rights law and found that there was a groundswell of support for the view that the UK's international obligations, even though they're not incorporated into Northern Ireland law, require exceptions so as to permit abortions for pregnancies which are a consequence of rape and or incest and where there's a fatal fetal abnormality. He also found that a fetus has no inherent right to life under the convention in situations where it would not be able to survive outside the body. So the judge made a declaration of incompatibility which meant that he was unable to read the legislation in Northern Ireland in any way that was compatible with the convention, particularly Article 8, the right to privacy that I mentioned earlier. So although the court found that there was um, d like a discriminatory element because having to travel to other jurisdictions was an emotional burden and it disproportionately impacted low-income people, it didn't make a um, declaration with regards to Article 14, so the right to be free from discrimination. So this decision was initially celebrated by many as a historic landmark for those who have used human rights discourse to highlight the difficulties and dangers that the current restrictive legal position um, produces for individuals facing crisis pregnancy. However, 
The judgment alone does not change the law, and this has been left to the legislators, and that's a point I'll return to in a minute. It's also worth knowing, noting that the judgment has been appealed, so the Department of Justice has appealed the finding that there's no right to life applicable to a fetus that can't survive outside the pregnant person's body, and also the findings in relation to sexual crime. And that reflects um, concerns that have been expressed by David Ford in the past with regards to how difficult it would be to prove sexual crimes in this context. So the entire judgment has also been appealed by the Attorney General, and he's argued that allowing abortion in cases of fatal fetal abnormalities would breach international human rights law as it would discriminate against children with disabilities. Um, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission has also issued a cross appeal challenging the positions of the Department of Justice and the Attorney General. So the judgment is yet to be issued, so for now we wait and speculate as to how these competing challenges will be assessed. If the case is taken further, we may see it before the UK Supreme Court and may even see it go to the European Court of Human Rights, where the court would be given the opportunity to assess whether the law in Northern Ireland breaches convention rights. But for now, abortion remains a criminal offence except in the very exceptional circumstances mentioned. And due to a historical lack of medical guidance for practitioners, even access to lawful um, abortion through the NHS is limited in Northern Ireland. And doctors are afraid of prosecution if they advise or perform abortion. So as a result of this, individuals rely a lot on kind of private healthcare, such as Mary Stopes, and thousands of individuals have also traveled to other parts of the UK in order to access legal abortion there. So these pathways may well be lawful, but they are very expensive. And that brings to the second possible critical juncture, which is the current legal challenge to this situation. And that's making its way through the English courts. And there's a Supreme Court hearing scheduled for the 2nd of November. So the applicants in that case are claiming that both the right to privacy and family life and the prohibition on discrimination are being violated by the fact that they cannot access free abortion in England because of being resident in Northern Ireland. So if the Supreme Court were to find in the applicant's favour, then this might put pressure on the UK um, to ensure access to NHS abortions for Northern Irish citizens in England. However, the applicants have been unsuccessful so far. So the Court of Appeal found it's not for the Secretary of State responsible for England's health service to remedy what may well be considered the harsh consequences of law adopted by the devolved legislature in Northern Ireland. So both the High Court and the Court of Appeal in this case framed the provision of abortion as a health service and criminal justice issue and therefore as one that is devolved. And this framing of abortion as a devolved issue has been used by the UK government to justify its inaction in this regard. So certainly abortion policy was devolved to the Northern Ireland Assembly in 2010 and that was part of the devolution of wider policing and justice powers and justice and health remain devolved issues. However, as was noted by the Northern Irish High Court in the Judicial Review Judgment, the UK's international human rights obligations are not devolved and nor are human rights a fully devolved issue. So this view has been, this view has been reflected internationally as I noticed a few moments ago, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child has called on the UK government to decriminalise abortion in Northern Ireland in all circumstances and to review legislation with a view to ensuring access to safe abortion and post-abortion care. It's not been alone in this. Amnesty International, the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, and the Economic and Social Committee and the Universal Periodic Review of the UK's Human Rights have all requested that Westminster intervene and amend the punitive provisions placed on people who seek abortion in Northern Ireland. So this demonstrates that to international bodies, the UK government is seen as having the responsibility of protecting the rights of its citizens, regardless of devolution. There's also been some evidence of some tentative political movement in this direction within Westminster. So in April this year, calls came from a group of Labour MPs for action on the prosecution of women in Northern Ireland for having abortions. And this was prompted by another of the critical junctures, um, which was the commencement of prosecutions against an individual for taking abortion medication and then against a mother for procuring abortion bills, pills for her daughter. So the Labour MPs felt compelled to act after the first woman was given a three-month prison sentence, suspended over 12 months. And in a letter to the Joint Shadow Minister, the MPs highlighted that elsewhere in the UK and in nearly every other country in Europe, 
the woman who was recently convicted would have been able to obtain a medical abortion in a safe and legal way, as well as receiving the support of healthcare professionals to support her during what was clearly an extremely difficult time. We appreciate that abortion is devolved, however human rights are not. While this is evidence of at least some in Westminster framing abortion as a human rights issue worthy of their intervention, not all share this approach. So when MP Diana Johnson requested a debate on the issue, stating it was the responsibility of Westminster to uphold the human rights of women, Chris Grayling, leader of the House, declined, saying, I am not impersonally in favour of women who seek abortion being punished for doing so, but of course this is a devolved matter. So whether the Supreme Court ruling will have any impact on this approach remains to be seen, but for now it seems unlikely that Westminster will intervene in this issue. So with that said, that doesn't mean that Westminster may not be about to directly impact on the ability of people to access abortion, which brings me to the ultimate critical juncture of Brexit. So with Brexit looming on the horizon, we may in fact see greater restrictions on two freedoms which play an important role in access to abortion, and that's the freedom of services and the freedom of movement. So under the freedom of services, abortion clinics in countries that do allow for legal abortion, such as in the Netherlands, can advertise those services in other EU states. And thanks to the free movement of people, European citizens can move between European countries easily and they can seek legal abortions in other EU states. So if the, e the UK leaves the EU, these principles may well be under threat. And while that might be seen to be most obviously impactful on people living in the Republic who use the UK's legal abortion services, you can see that it will also make abortion harder and ultimately much more expensive for those who seek abortion outside of Northern Ireland. And that increases the impact of lack of abortion on the people who are most frequently kind of impacted by all kind of restrictions on abortion, and that's those that fall into a lower socioeconomic bracket. So with this kind of mounting recognition that the status quo is a violation of human rights, we have an inactive Westminster and we have the threat of greater restrictions. It's worth considering whether there has been or is likely to be any movement towards reform within Stormont. Renewed calls for reform certainly followed the High Court's judgment earlier this year. And in February, Stephen Agnew Emily submitted amendments to the Executive's Justice No. 2 bill and that would have brought the abortion law in line with the High Court's judgment. However, MLA has voted against abortion in the case of fatal fetal abnormalities by 59 to 40, and against allowing abortion where the pregnancy is the consequence of sexual crime by 64 to 32. So those kind of developments are obviously not encouraging for those that are in favor of broader abortion rights, but they seem to be reflective of the attitude within Stormont. DUP remains socially conservative, Arlene Foster has been vocal about her uh, opposition to the extension of the Abortion Act. And in the past, DUP MLAs have sought to tighten the laws on abortion. So for example, example by restricting um, the work of private clinics such as Mary Stopes. SDLP also has a long history of opposing abortion reform. And the Green Party and People Before Profit are some of the only uh, parties that have declared themselves pro-choice with Alliance and the UUP allowing for free votes and Sinn Féin apparently being in favour of limited reform of the type that we've seen outlined in the High Court judgment. So despite the failure to make amendments in February, there is some ongoing consideration um, of abortion within Stormont. Uh, a working group established to examine abortion, at least in cases of fatal fetal abnormality, is expected to issue its report any day now. And the Health Minister, Michelle O'Neill, has stated that if there is a recommendation for legislative change, she would certainly be up for making that change. However, on the other side of that, the Justice Minister, Claire Sudgeon, has made clear that there will need to be more executive action um, in order to make this a reality. And it's also been made clear that in relation to abortion in cases of sexual crime, there's much less willingness to consider uh, change. So, it's worth noting, um, kind of before wrapping up, that a lot of the opposition, um, or a lot of opposition amongst MLAs towards abortion reform, um, seems to come from a belief that there's kind of cross-community support for strict regulation um, of abortion within Northern Ireland. And certainly there has been a strong kind of history of anti-abortion sentiment, and there are ongoing um, very vocal anti-abortion groups, just as there's very vocal um, pro-choice groups. However, it does appear that that kind of cross-community attitude is changing, 
So the Northern Ireland Life and Time Survey in 2008 demonstrate, demonstrated that the Northern Irish population was supportive of a slightly more liberal um, legislation that would allow for abortion in circumstances such as those contained within the High Court judgment. And going even further, 2014 Amnesty poll revealed that up to 60% were in favour of access to abortion in cases of fatal fetal abnormalities, with almost 70% being in favour of access to abortion in cases of sexual crime. So the social conservatism we see visible in Stormont may not necessarily be reflective of that of the electorate anymore. So we wrap all these different strands together. What kind of picture do we get with regards to the future of abortion rights? So for one, we're likely to see a number of judgments come out in the future which have implications for the way this debate is framed. We'll see whether the UK Supreme Court supports findings that it's not for the Secretary of State in England to make abortion free for those from Northern Ireland. And it'll be interesting to see whether they engage with this language of human rights, which was um, kind of rejected by the Court of Appeal and High Court. We'll also see how that court handles this issue of devolution versus human rights framework. Um, we'll see whether there were any successful appeals against the High Court finding that the current legal system is in breach of international human rights law. And we may well see some of these issues come before the European Court of Human Rights, who would then be given the opportunity to assess the proportionality of um, Northern Ireland's legal framework. So outside these judgments, we might see some action within Westminster um, with regards to this decriminalisation of abortion. And there does appear to be pressure from at least a small group of MPs in that regard. And we may also see the impact of restrictive legislation um, be made all the greater by Brexit. Whether we will see change here within Stormont remains to be seen. Uh, certainly there is increased international pressure from UN human rights organisations, particularly with regards to this fatal fetal abnormality and sexual crime framework. However, we can see that social conservatism and anti-abortion sentiment are still quite dominant amongst MLAs and to some extent within Northern Irish society as well, although surveys do suggest that that may well be changing. So it'll be interesting to see how Stormont reacts to these upcoming reports and judgments, um, and it'll be interesting to hear what you all think of the future. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Rachel. Um, as I said, there's time for a, a quick question now, if anybody would li like to immediately react or ask a question now, but we'll also have time towards the end. Would anybody like to ask a question at this stage? Okay, well, we'll move on to our next speaker, who's Bryce Dixon, who's Professor of International and Comparative Law at Queen's, former Chief Commissioner of the Human Rights Commission. He's the author of the European Convention on Human Rights and the Conflict in Northern Ireland, as well as Human Rights in the UK Supreme Court. And Bryce today is going to cheer us all up. His title is Remaining Positive and Creative. Thank you, Colin. Well, yes, I think I mean, people who work in the human rights field have always tried to be positive and creative because we're always trying to improve the situation. But it would be justifiable to be a bit despondent at the moment when you look around, whether globally or more locally. The conflicts in Syria and the Yemen, for example, are posing really serious human rights questions for the international community. The US presidential election has the potential to elect somebody, I won't say who, who, um, who will not be a friend of human rights around the world at all. I think generally there's a growing acceptance that globalization, while it has many benefits, has lots of defects when it comes to inequalities within society. We have Brexit, which I know Chris is going to focus on later. Um, and we have the potential breakup of the UK, given uh, the rise of Scottish independent movement. So we live in turbulent times, but it is important to be positive and creative when looking at the human rights situation. We need to focus on the human rights standards which uh, the UK government and parliament have uh, promised to uphold through ratifying and incorporating international treaties into our law. And um, to the extent that our own legislators here in Northern Ireland have conferred additional rights, we need to uh, ensure that they are properly Im implemented as well. There is unfortunately no right to have equality within a state as to the distribution of rights, as we know. That's one of the failings in the ECHR, uh, though there may be other ways through judicial review and the mechanisms that Rachel mentioned of achieving equality within the country. 
We should bear in mind, I think, that under the Northern Ireland Act of 1998, although international relations are an accepted matter, there's an exception to that, which is the observation and implementation of international obligations. So it is within the power, and under my understanding, for the, uh, within the power of the Northern Ireland Assembly and Executive to implement international human rights treaties within Northern Ireland in a way which goes beyond how they are implemented in the rest of the UK. The likelihood of that happening, of course, given our political makeup here, is, is low. But also, <clears throat> when considering what to do on the human rights front, I think we should do well to remember that not all claims for improvements to society or changes to society can justifiably be framed in human rights terms. Um, the whole question of the, uh, the right um, to choose um, that, that ri the ritual was talking about indirectly um, is, at the end of the day, I think, difficult to analyse in terms of, of human rights. Um, the question of who should be allowed into the country is a, is a difficult human rights question. If you, if you leave to one side the, the refugee issue, um, to what extent should economic migrants have a right to enter any particular country? At the moment, under international human rights law, that right does not exist. And even on the social and economic front, while there should be a right to health care, for example, I think it's difficult to argue that there is a right to good health, per se. That's like saying there's a right to good luck, and uh, we need to draw the limits at some point as to you know, what we can campaign on as human rights issues as opposed to rights issues or social justice issues. I'm now going to talk about the situation concerning the Human Rights Act, and then I'll turn to the Northern Irish position more specifically. Where do we stand as regards the Human Rights Act? Well, as I'm sure you all know, there was a commission on a... UK Bill of Rights, which sat from 2011 to 2012, ultimately came up with a divided report as to whether there should or should not be a Bill of Rights for the UK. But in 2014, the Conservative Party, then part of the coalition, uh, issued a document in which it said that it would be drafting a Bill of Rights and Responsibilities for the UK and putting that forward for consultation. Um, that paper has never appeared. Two years have elapsed, but we still haven't seen it. In the manifesto of the Conservative Party for the 2015 election, they promised to repeal the Human Rights Act and to replace it with a Bill of Rights. And they said that they would formally break the link, or rather break the formal link, between British courts and the European Court of Human Rights. They would reverse the, quote, mission creep uh, that has that has occurred um, within the Strasbourg system, whereby rights are being protected, which allegedly were never in the mind of the drafters of the Human Rights Convention. The manifesto also said that the, the, the new Bill of Rights would prevent terrorists and other serious foreign criminals from fighting deportation. And it said that the... Uh, extending of the convention to the work done by British soldiers abroad uh, would be brought to an end. Michael Gove, who was then the Lord Chancellor and Secretary of State for Justice, said that a consultation paper would be issued, uh, reminiscent of what Chris Grayling had said in 2014. We're still waiting for that consultation paper as well. They keep postponing it. Uh, most recently, they postponed it in the run-up to the referendum in June because they didn't want the debate over the Human Rights Act to get mixed up with the debate over the European Union. But Mrs May and other government ministers have since clarified to some extent what the new Bill of Rights uh, document will say uh, or what it won't say. So she's made it clear that the UK will remain a party to the European Convention on Human Rights. So I presume that means we'll, disappointed litigants within Britain will still be able to take their cases to Strasbourg. Uh, they've said that convention rights will still be part of our domestic law. So that bit of the Human Rights Act will be replicated in whatever new legislation is put in place. 
but the relationship between our courts and the European Court of Human Rights will change. I presume that means that the, the duty under Section 2 of the Human Rights Act on British courts to take account of Strasbourg jurisprudence uh, will be removed. Whether it's legally possible for um, the, the new bill to prohibit British courts from even considering uh, European court jurisprudence, I think is, is uh, I, I don't think that is legally possible. I'm not sure uh, how judges could not get around that. I think they could get around that uh, indirectly, for example, by citing decisions of other national courts, which themselves have referred to European Court of Human Rights decisions. Um, but the, the bill will no doubt say something about the weight which British judges should give to those decisions of the European Court of Human Rights. It's also likely that sections three and four of the Human Rights Act about interpreting uh, the law so far as is possible to do so in a way which is compatible with the Convention and about issuing declarations of incompatibility will go. And the right under uh, section seven of the Human Rights Act to sue a public authority in the UK for not adhering to Convention rights might also go. And that would be a very significant change and, and regressive move, in my view. As regards the, um, well, the, the, the one recent development that I should note in this is that um, the government has said that it's going to derogate from the European Convention to make sure that the European Convention does not apply to British forces operating overseas. And many of you will have seen last week that the Joint Committee on Human Rights in Parliament has issued a letter to the Secretary of State for Defence asking a whole series of questions about how this will be done and questioning really whether it can legally be done in compliance with Article 15 of the Convention. Meanwhile, the Scottish Government is opposed to any alteration to the Human Rights Act and elements of the Northern Ireland Executive are opposed to it as well, but, but not uh, the biggest party, the DUP. Now, the Scottish Government um, could, I think, fairly easily ensure the enactment of a Scottish Human Rights Act to supplement any UK Bill of Rights that's put in force, because human rights, of course, are devolved to Scotland just as they are to Northern Ireland. In theory, the Executive and Assembly in Northern Ireland could do likewise, but we are held back, in a sense, by the, by the, uh, the power-sharing cross-community voting arrangements that we have in Northern Ireland. It would be very difficult to achieve uh, a cross-community vote in favour of a supplementary Human Rights Act in Northern Ireland, depending on its content, of course. So to me, um, the, the two ways in which human rights activists here could be positive and creative in this field are, firstly, um, we should encourage the lawyers and judges in this jurisdiction to make greater use of international human rights norms when they are litigating. Uh, and there is some evidence that in recent years, lawyers and judges have been more open to arguments based on treaties which have not yet been incorporated into our law, but which have been ratified by the UK government. So the Convention on the Rights of the Child, the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, the Convention Against Torture, etc., have all been referred to in the courts of Northern Ireland and uh, in, in some ways have, have, um, have influenced the decisions of the judges in Northern Ireland, certainly as regards the best interests of the child doctrine. In a couple of recent examples, I can uh, refer you to a case called McLean in 2014, uh, where the issue was whether a prisoner who had been punished by the governor of the prison for some, um, some misdemeanor uh, could then be uh, prosecuted for the same crime, for the same piece of action. And he called in aid um, Article 1 of Protocol 4 to the European Convention, which prohibits people being uh, punished twice for the same piece of behaviour, but that's a protocol which the UK government hasn't ratified. Uh, the applicant also cited the European prison rules and the UN standard minimum rules on, on, on prisons. And um, the judge looked at all those standards and took them into account when coming to his decision, which I'm sorry to say was that um, the prosecution could go ahead because there wasn't a direct overlap as regards the, the, the conduct that was, that was being punished. But nevertheless, 
the courts are open to looking at those standards. And in a case called Reed in 2014, uh, Mr Justice Horner, who decided the, the abortion case in Northern Ireland, uh, referred to the Charter on um, Minority and Regional Languages in, Nor in uh, Europe, the o Council of Europe Charter, which has not been incorporated into our domestic law. And he looked at its standards when deciding whether <clears throat> the current law in Northern Ireland on the naming of streets in, in, uh, in more than one language was compatible with that charter. Uh, he held that it was compatible, but again, he looked at that charter as an important set of standards. So we need to encourage that. Secondly, in advocating or in responding to any consultation on the UK Bill of Rights, we should be demanding more rights, not fewer rights, than exist under the Convention. Um, and some of those rights could be rights which are dear to the hearts of members of the Conservative Party in the UK. For example, jury trial, or um, rights which already exist under our domestic law, such as the right to free education, and soon to be extended free education and training until the age of 18. The right to free health care at the point of delivery, part of the constitution of the National Health Service. All of those things could be incorporated into a new Bill of Rights for the UK without actually extending domestic law to any great extent, but would copper fasten to an extent the protection of those social and economic rights in the UK. I can think of other examples, but uh, I'll, I'll move on to the Northern Irish situation. Um, I don't think it's any great secret, but I've moved away from the idea that the Bill of Rights, which many of us in this room worked on for many years and uh, campaigned for and thought was extremely important to the peace process in Northern Ireland, I, for one, have moved away from, from that uh, conclusion because I think... Um, the, the efforts to return to the Bill of Rights idea, especially, I'm afraid, the draft that was recommended by the Commission in 2008, is going to be counterproductive and divisive in our society. It's almost as if it's a, a toxic concept, the, the Bill of Rights idea, um, and it's possibly past its sell-by date. Um, and I say that not just because there, there is no unanimity within the Assembly here, or, or even consensus within the Assembly for enacting a Bill of Rights. There isn't at Westminster either. And even if Jeremy Corbyn became the Prime Minister, which is a big if, is it not, it's very unlikely that he too would sign up to the proposals put forward by the, the Human Rights Commission. So while a lot of that work was very good and justifiable at the time, I think, I think we have to kill our darlings on this one and move on and try to achieve the same things almost by different routes. And to do that, we need to, be, we need to be clear about what the human rights issues are in Northern Ireland. What are the important ones? And I think they are ones that don't actually relate to the peace process. I think we've more or less dealt with the issues concerning the troubles. Apart from dealing with the past, that's a big if. And we need to make progress on dealing with the past. But the international human rights standards on dealing with the past are themselves pretty vague and uh, not very sophisticated at the moment, and there's not a great deal of consensus around them. But we do need to deal with the past. I don't deny that. But otherwise, the main issues, I think, are the excessive inequalities in our society between the well-off and the poor, the excessive numbers of children living in poverty in Northern Ireland. 23% of the children living here are living below the poverty line, in, in households below the poverty line, which is 6% more than in the rest of the UK, which is still a very high number. Um, we have a very uh, much higher percentage of our adults and pensioners living on the breadline in Northern Ireland than is the case in the rest of the UK. Again, there's a 5% differential there. As regards employment rates, on average, the rate in Northern Ireland is 5% less than in the rest of Great Britain, uh, the rest of, in, than in Great Britain. And if you look at particular sectors like young people and lone parents and people with disabilities, the differential in employment rates between us and GB go up to 12 or 
Additionally, we have a failing National Health Service in Northern Ireland with huge waiting times for operations and far too few senior doctors. We have, and I'm, I'm listing these probably in, in, in order of importance in my eyes anyway, the next big gap in our human rights situation in Northern Ireland is the lack of any right to integrated education, which I think is at the basis of the divisions in our society, and we need to give parents the right to send their children to integrated schools. Oddly, that wasn't a right that was included in the Human Rights Commission's Bill of Rights advice in 2008, despite, I think, its centrality to uh, Northern Ireland. It, it's one of the special circumstances regarding Northern Ireland. More generally, we in Northern Ireland have fallen behind Great Britain as regards equality law, there, they have benefited from the Equality Acts of 2006 and 2010. We no longer are on a par with the rest of the UK as regards equality, so rights of carers here are not as extensive as they are in GB. The right of older people to claim discrimination in access to goods, facilities and services doesn't exist here, whereas it does in the rest of the UK. The public sector duties that we have under Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act, which have done a great deal of good in Northern Ireland, are being outperformed by the public sector duties in Great Britain, where the enforcement system is, is uh, much more effective. Um, the right of Irish language users here is much less than the right of Welsh language users, for example. The right of gay people to marry doesn't exist. We're the only part of these islands, which doesn't have that right. Those, I think, are the main issues that we need to be campaigning on and, and trying to push a human rights perspective on. So we need action on those sorts of areas. And the way I think to do, to bring about that um, change and, to, and to, to act is to, first of all, press for more public spending on the social and economic issues welfare and the health service in particular. And if that means saying that, that there more, there's a need for greater taxation, we have to be honest about that. Um, I know we could argue for a larger block grant to be given to us from Westminster, but we could also be arguing for greater borrowing and taxation powers for the Northern Ireland Assembly, just like the Scottish Parliament has achieved in recent months. We need, I think, to develop a better system for measuring equality. We ought to have a statutory equality index that has to be published every year, detailing differentials in income levels, housing conditions, health indicators, etc. And we need, I think, to push for a human rights and equality bill at the Assembly. That will be difficult, but politics is the art of compromise. And if we could include in that bill something which would satisfy the unionists, in particular the DUP, and something which would satisfy the nationalists, in particular Sinn Féin, then perhaps, just perhaps, we might, we might see some progress. Those two parties seem anxious to demonstrate that they can work together successfully for the whole of Northern Ireland. Perhaps they could give and take a little each and benefit, but benefit all of us. They could even if they really wanted to, retain the essence of the Human Rights Act, the sections two, three, four, and seven points that I mentioned earlier in any such human rights and equality bill for Northern Ireland. So I think it behoves all of us to turn our eyes to that kind of action rather than with the greatest respect to those who still ardently campaign for a Bill of Rights. Rather than focusing on that, we need to focus on something which is much more likely to lead to real change. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Bryce. And Bryce and Rachel have given us two very thoughtful presentations and papers on the current situation and the ways forward. Again, as with Bryce uh, here, would anybody like to ask an immediate quick question or what's been said? Okay, so we'll hold all those. Think about your comments and reflections. We'll come back. I'm going to invite now Chris to join us at the front. I think you can get a mic as well, Chris. And
speaker is uh, Christopher McCrudden, who's Professor of Human Rights and Equality Law at Queen's. He's also the William W. Cook Global Professor at the University of Michigan Law School. He's a fellow of the British Academy. He's author of a large range of publications, including Buying Social Justice, and with Brendan O'Leary, Courts and Consociations, Human Rights versus Power Sharing. And Chris is going to speak to us today about uh, the Brexit litigation, human rights and equality. Thanks, Colin. Thanks for, um, for organizing this, um, and thanks for, for inviting me to, to speak. Um, can you hear me at the back? Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about the Brexit litigation, um, which is um, no simple task uh, in, in both uh, personal and legal terms. Um, I need to enter a sort of caveat at, at the beginning here, because um, along with um, uh, several other colleagues, um, we're representing uh, a group of litigants uh, in the Belfast High Court in, uh, in the Brexit litigation. Um, that's the a new case, um, and uh, that's um, being run by uh, David Schofield, QC, uh, Gordon Anthony, and, and myself. Uh, there's a, an additional piece of litigation, the McCord litigation, um, which is being run separately also in the Belfast High Court. Um, and I'll come to some of the details of that in, in a minute. Uh, this is separate from and in addition to the litigation that's occurring in London, which you'll have seen probably somewhat more publicity about. Um, and um, the Belfast litigation was in the High Court um, for two and a half days last week. The London litigation is um, in the Divisional Court in, in London um, as we speak for three days. So. Um, I'll speak in a minute about um, how those uh, relate to each other um, and how they differ. Um, but I need to say at the beginning, um, since I'm uh, representing um, Mr. Gnew and several other clients, um, I'll, I'll be speaking as it were as them rather than in a personal capacity. You'll understand the reasons for that. So, um, in the um, proceedings, basically, the applicants are seeking a variety of reliefs um, related to the respondent's approach to triggering Article 50, which is um, the provision that governs the exit um, of the UK and others, should they wish to do so, um, from the European Union. Um, there, is, there is and always was the possibility that uh, the UK might seek not to use Article 50, but the government uh, now seems to be committed to using the Article 50 process. Um, and so um, the initial two stages of that are probably well known to you, which is that a member state uh, may decide to withdraw from the union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements, in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. Um, and then secondly, a member state that decides to withdraw shall notify the European Council of its intention. Um, one of the um, key questions is um, whether or not um, a state that does notify the European Council can withdraw that notification. Um, we'll come to the uh, effect of that uh, debate in a moment. Uh, just want to pause at that point to say there is a debate as to whether the notification can be withdrawn or not. Um, assuming that things proceed uh, after notification, then uh, within two years, uh, the negotiations will take place. Um, and uh, if they're completed successfully, then uh, there will be an exit on the basis of that agreement. Um, if the proceedings are not concluded within two years, then there is the option either um, for all member states um, to uh, agree to the uh, continuation of the negotiations. That's it has to be a unanimous agreement. Um, failing that, um, then the United Kingdom would withdraw automatically uh, with no agreement. Um, uh, the treaties would cease to apply and the United Kingdom will be out um, with no access uh, of any kind. Okay, so um, what's the judicial review about? And um, I'll sketch out very broadly what it's about and then I'll come uh, in the brief time available to the human rights dimensions of that. So um, there are, um, there's a series of arguments, essentially, 
Um, one argument, the first argument, is the one that may be more familiar to you on the basis of um, the UK uh, litigation, the London litigation, which is the argument that the royal prerogative um, that the government intends to use to trigger Article 50, um, we're arguing that um, that is not possible, um, uh, that an act of parliament is necessary to authorise um, the triggering of Article 50. Um, and the argument essentially is um, that uh, the royal prerogative has been displaced um, in, this, in this area by the European Communities Act, the Northern Ireland Act, and the European Union Act 2011. Um, so um, that's critical uh, argument for both the Belfast litigation and the London litigation. The difference is that the London litigation is only primarily arguing the European Communities Act as having displaced the royal prerogative. Um, and uh, we are primarily emphasizing the Northern Ireland Act, 1998, as having displaced the royal prerogative. Um, we also argued the European Communities Act point. Um, that point here has been put into temporary abeyance um, pending the result of the London litigation. Um, there was an initial uh, attempt to get uh, quite a lot of issues. Uh, in fact, the bulk of the issues uh, in the Northern Ireland litigation transferred also to London, as it were. Um, and uh, the argument was that they would be taken up and argued in the divisional court. And um, our argument, which was successful, was that the uh, Belfast court should uh, retain jurisdiction over the bulk of those issues. So the only issue that's been te uh, temporarily suspended in Belfast is the European Communities Act 1972 point. All other points uh, that I'm about to mention will be heard, have been heard in the Belfast litigation. So the first argument then, the first broad argument is uh, no royal prerogative um, needs an act of parliament. Um, second argument uh, is that um, if, as we say, there is a requirement for an act of parliament, um, we're arguing that that triggers the requirement for a legislative consent motion in the Northern Ireland Assembly. Uh, this all sounds rather technical, um, and um, of course it is technical, um, but it is of fairly considerable importance because um, the argument is that with the requirement for the Northern Ireland Assembly to consent in advance to the passage of the required legislation, um, that of course um, gives a significant power to the Northern Ireland Assembly. The argument for this is uh, essentially twofold. Um, first, that uh, the triggering of Article 50 would in itself um, affect the um, area of powers that are devolved to the Northern Ireland Assembly. Um, and that, therefore, there is a requirement for a legislative consent motion. Um, and secondly, that um, it is possible for the court, the uh, domestic court, to declare that there is a constitutional convention to that effect um, using um, a case that was decided in Canada by the Canadian Supreme Court uh, relating to an equivalent issue regarding the uh, repatriation of the uh, Charter of Rights um, in the 1980s, where the Supreme Court of Canada declared that there was such a convention. Um, so we're not technically asking for it to be enforced in terms of a, a mandamus or anything. We're asking for declaration. So that's the second argument. Third argument um, is um, that, and that second argument, of course, is not being run in, uh, in London. Uh, the third argument essentially is that if we're wrong on both those points, um, so if there is no requirement for legislation, uh, we're uh, arguing that the exercise of the royal prerogative is still subject to public law constraints. Um, the royal prerogative being essentially, for all intents and purposes, an administrative law power, and therefore subject to uh, administrative law um, requirements. Um, so, um, for example, um, there is a, a question about whether or not um, there is a need to uh, take into account all alternatives um, to Article 50 being triggered. Um, and there have been, and the Scottish government is working um, also on questions of that sort. Um, so in other words, there would be a requirement under um, domestic administrative law um, for all uh, reasonable alternatives to be um, 
uh, considered, we're suggesting the same in this context as well. Um, so that's essentially the third argument. Um, the um, fourth argument um, is rather different. The fourth argument is um, outside, or in addition to, the classic uh, arguments that I've just made in terms of uh, UK um, constitutional law. The um, additional argument is relating to um, Article 50 of um, the treaty, seen from the viewpoint of European Union law. Um, and um, in that context, um, there are interesting questions that arise, um, which we're arguing, uh, relating to the extent to which um, the European Court of Justice um, can become involved in interpreting Article 50 uh, in terms, for example, of the requirement for um, Article 50, for the uh, UK to um, seek to leave only after um, and in satisfaction of its constitutional requirements. And the question is, who actually decides the constitutional requirements point? There's an additional question, which I'll come to in a bit, uh, bit more detail in a moment, um, of the question of whether there are additional restrictions on uh, the triggering of Article 50, um, which are not stated in Article 50 itself, but are derived from uh, European Union general principles. Um, and of course, each of those questions is um, deeply controversial um, and um, really quite important. And therefore, um, it may well come to pass that at some point, um, a court uh, may decide that it wishes to hear the views of the European Court of Justice on these issues. Okay, everybody happy so far. Uh, so, in terms of the um, litigation in London, it's, it's generally referred to now as the Miller litigation. Um, the litigation in London, uh, as I said, there was an attempt uh, to essentially have most of these issues transferred to London. Um, the, uh, Mr. Justice McGuire and the High Court in Belfast decided um, against that, with the exception of the European Communities Act point. So, we are um, all steam ahead. So just to sum up then, um, there's the displacement of the royal prerogative um, by the Northern Ireland Act. Um, there's um, the question of the legislative consent motion. Um, there's the, in the alternative, um, whether the exercise of the royal prerogative is itself subject to um, domestic constitutional law requirements. And there's the meaning of Article 50 itself as a question of European Union law. Yep. Okay, so um, where does human rights come in to all of this? Um, and it comes in really quite interestingly, I think, in terms of the argument um, that we're putting. Uh, and this is all um, public. I'm not uh, betraying any uh, confidences here. So let's turn to the last point, first of all. So the Article 50 point. And as I've said, um, under Article 50, um, it states that the UK must decide to withdraw from the, European, from the Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements. Uh, that is, of course, um, the UK exercising a treaty right. So this may not seem like it in terms of the debate, but that's precisely what the UK is doing, is exercising a treaty right um, under Article 50. Um, now, there are obviously, in terms of broader constitutional, British constitutional law, um, there is the sovereignty of parliament. Um, but for the moment, if you go under Article 50, you're not exercising parliamentary sovereignty. You're exercising a treaty right. Um, so the um, question is whether the constitutional requirements here um, themselves comport with foundational values and general principles of European Union law. And these include, of course, um, Article 2 of the TEU, the, the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights, including the rights of persons belonging to minorities. So the treaty uh, indeed expressly recognizes in Article 2 that these values are common to the member states in a society in which pluralism, non-discrimination, tolerance, justice, solidarity, and equality between men and women prevail. So 
Um, when EU law then provides that, the, European, that the, the United Kingdom may decide to leave the Union in accordance with its own constitutional requirements, um, we're arguing that these terms for EU law purposes must be understood to include and to comport with general principles of European Union law, including the values set forth in Article 2. So should the decision to leave the Union fail to satisfy these fundamental requirements, it would not qualify as a lawful decision, which can be notified to the European Council for the purposes of triggering Article 50. So that's the first place in which uh, human rights um, arguments surface. Second place in which um, they surface uh, relates to the um, question of, under European Union law, again, of the relationship between um, the exercise of the prerogative um, and um, the requirement for legislation. So the extent to which the prerogative has been displaced um, for, uh, in this territory. Uh, and it's clear that the implications for Northern Ireland um, of triggering Article 50 include um, several areas that are um, devolved areas, um, but also, of course, significant areas that are devolved as a result of an international agreement. Um, so the suggestion is that it would material, materially alter the devolution settlement within the UK, um, as well as the intergovernmental settlement within, with the government of Ireland. So in other words, there are two arguments, as it were. There's the Northern Ireland Act as having displaced the prerogative, but there's also there's an international agreement in the area which will be uh, affected by the uh, triggering. So that's one argument. Additional argument with regard to the triggering of the prerogative is that it's clear that the royal prerogative cannot be used to abrogate rights that are granted to individuals. The royal prerogative cannot be used to abrogate rights that are granted to individuals. Uh, and that goes way back to the case of proclamations, 1610. So we're um, using pretty orthodox um, constitutional principles here. Uh, and you will remember, of course, that the case of proclamations, uh, the court says, the king by his proclamation cannot change any part of the common law or statute law or the customs of the realm. So in its more modern, modern form, that rule is basically linked to the principle of legality, whereby the government can interfere with rights only when the interference has been authorized by uh, parliament, and that goes to um, a statement by Lord Hoffman in um, Ex Party Sims in 2000. So under the Northern Ireland Act, of course, this is particularly important. Um, for instance, the human rights provisions included in the devolution arrangements in Northern Ireland are, unlike those in the rest of the UK, underpinned by an international agreement between the Republic of Ireland and the UK. Um, in particular, the Belfast Agreement uh, incorporates the protection of human rights provided in the European Convention on Human Rights, as we've heard, in Strand 1, and provides for the way in which those safeguards are to be made, be made effective. But here's the point. One of the ways, and this will be familiar to um, uh, several of you, of, of you in the audience, um, one of the ways in which it was expected at the time of the agreement and subsequently that the ECHR would be made effective in Northern Ireland is via the operation of EU law. And so let me put that point again. One of the ways in which the ECHR is made effective is through EU law. Um, and that gives the convention additional force and an additional way in which remedies for breach of ECHR-based norms may be access accessed in Northern Ireland, uh, ensuring the application of such ECHR uh, R norms. Um, and so, in other words, the weakening or the displacement of EU law has an effect in terms of the making effective of ECHR norms because of the overlap between general principles of EU law and the ECHR, um, as well as the Charter, of course, which is overlapping. And uh, we, we, we've seen in recent days the importance of EU law in Northern Ireland is increasingly clear. Um, in, indeed, one of the areas in which you spoke was, in fact, the operation of EU law. So the effect of leaving the EU will remove the substantive human rights protections that EU law brings, and as a result, these will no longer be enforceable in the Northern Irish courts, 
and access will be denied to the additional wider range of remedies for breach of ECHR norms, including access to the Court of Justice and remedies greater than a declaration of incompatibility under the uh, Human Rights Act. So that's an additional area in which um, the ECHR and the EU overlap in terms of challenging um, the triggering of Article 50. Next area um, uh, in which, and I'll, I'll end at this point because I'm conscious of time, um, in which uh, human rights arguments come into play um, is with regard to the relationship between the Northern Ireland office um, and um, the decision making in the British government itself over the triggering of Article 50. And of course, um, uh, the royal prerogative, if, if it was chosen to do it that way, would nevertheless be uh, authorized um, after cabinet uh, discussion, we are assuming, rather than uh, by a prime minister herself, uh, unadvised by the rest of her cabinet. And so the role of the Northern Ireland office then is quite interesting here. Um, so what exactly is the advice that the Northern Ireland office is giving uh, with regard to Article 50? Um, so the argument in this context is, and uh, it was mentioned earlier on by Bryce, um, is that at this point, Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act comes into play. Section 75, of course, being um, the idea that um, equality of opportunity uh, needs to be assessed, the effect of unequal opportunity needs to be assessed um, by um, a governmental actor to which article uh, to which Section 75 applies, um, and um, that that generates both substantive and procedural requirements uh, in terms of um, what the Northern Ireland um, Office is able to do. I keep on referring to the Northern Ireland Office rather than the Secretary of State because the duty applies to the Northern Ireland Office, not to the Secretary of State in this context. So um, we've argued that the Northern Ireland Office, in providing advice and representation to the rest of Her Majesty's government uh, on the giving um, on the decision whether to uh, trigger Article 50, must comply with the statutory obligations under Section, 5, Section 75, and indeed the NIO's own equality scheme. Um, in particular, with regard to uh, consultation requirements, the screening of policies, the production of an equality impact assessment before the Secretary of State tenders his advice to the Cabinet, thereby providing um, a rather neat link back to the first set of comments. I'll end there, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Chris, as with the other speakers. Uh, would anybody like to ask Chris a question arising from that and before we open it out to a more general discussion? Okay, well, again, I'd just like to thank all speakers for both reflecting on where we are now and thinking about uh, the, the, the ways forward and just would like to perhaps before we, as you're mulling over your thoughts uh, this afternoon for the speakers, just to each of the speakers, obviously th there's the Brexit debate that, that, that's ongoing that Chris has outlined so well, but I suppose one of the big issues that we're, we're now facing into is the question Bryce raised about repeal of the Human Rights Act, and I suppose the question of what you know, the response to that should be. If there is a process triggered around a UK-wide consultation. And I just wondered, just going to, to my right, around the panel, just to ask them really what their own thoughts and reflections are on that current debate around repeal and replacement of the Human Rights Act. And I'm conscious Bryce did mention it a bit in his talk, but I'll just start with Bryce. Well, I think I've, I've kind of made my position clear. If, if the UK government is going to repeal the Act and replace it with something. Um, we need to be responding by pushing for uh, as many extra rights to be included in that new bill as possible. Uh, far from seeing it as you know, a terribly negative thing, we ought to be grasping it as an opportunity for the inclusion of further rights while challenging, for example, the derogation. I would challenge the derogation that they intend to apply when British forces are operating overseas. Um, and I would you know, challenge any limitation they're going to put on uh, pre uh, uh, preventing people who have been um, denied the right to family life uh, 
uh, from fighting their deportation. We need to adhere to the standards which the European Court has laid down in, in all of those respects. I'm not quite sure how the government can, can get away with not doing so because a litigant who loses in Britain is still going to be able to take their case to Strasbourg. If Britain then is to turn around and say, well, we're not going to implement that judgment in breach of Article 46 of the European Convention, well, that's the opportunity for the Committee of Ministers then to threaten to throw Britain out of the Council of Europe system temporarily. And that, that might bring the government to heel, just as it did the Greek colonels back in 1974. I'm not drawing a direct analogy there. <laughs> it, it's um, being recorded, Rachel. <laughs> I'll just think about that in terms of the specific abortion rights framework. I suppose because there's been these developments within the European court system in terms of their interpretation of certain rights as having impact on our abortion rights debate, a lot hinges on the ability of individuals to continue using that framework. Now, if, as Bryce says, if, we still, if individuals still have recourse, then they can still pursue um, cases with the European Court in light of, you know, if the case law that we're currently seeing within the UK fails to reach this kind of standard and fails to get the results that allow for this minimum requirement of abortion rights, if that is denied, then I think it becomes more important to pick up on something else that Bryce flagged, and that's the use of these other international human rights treaties, which arguably, you know, they go a lot further with regards to reproductive rights and, and rights to health care and it will become important for advocates on behalf of um, the rights regarding um, reproduction and, and right to abortion to, to draw on these international treaties and try to kind of bolster our human rights framework using those less direct means, I suppose. Okay, thank you, Rachel. Chris? Uh, so I've just come back from, from two conferences. One uh, conference that I ran in the States uh, on human rights um, practice and the other in um, the Netherlands. Um, and um, the, uh, I think we are kidding ourselves um, if we don't think that we're in a state uh, and in a condition um, worldwide where uh, human rights is increasingly questioned at a fundamental level. Um, so the notion that um, the repeal of the Human Rights Act is, as it were, a UK-only uh, um, action, I think, is, is naive. It's not. It's part of a, a, a much wider challenge um, to existing human rights protections. Um, hence the notion of attacking, attacking human rights defenders, um, human rights lawyers, etc. that uh, that Colin mentioned. Um, incidentally, uh, if you saw Theresa May's speech, you'll find that um, those who are opposing Brexit, Brexit are now labelled as subversive. Interesting choice of words. Um, so um, I have to say, I, not for the first time, uh, disagree with Bryce uh, on this. I, I see no good reason, no good reason for the repeal of the Human Rights Act. I, I didn't say there was a good reason for it. Secondly, um, I see no optimism uh, for <laughs> um, the idea that an existing Human Rights Act will be replaced by something better. I see no optimism for that at all. Um, I think the politics is absolutely against it. Uh, the politics is going to be um, that uh, if indeed there is an announcement for um, a Bill of Rights, it will be um, seen to be um, uh, in part either coincidentally linking to Brexit, in other words, there'll be a push that it's all seen to be sort of moving out of Europe, um, or that it'll be seen as a diversion if Brexit goes wrong. Uh, and it'll be um, a sop to um, the um, conservative um, right wing. Um, so um, I don't share his optimism on, on this um, at all. Um, where it links into to Brexit, coming back to that, and I, and I, I make no apologies for coming back to Brexit because I think it's um, fundamentally related to the human rights issue. Um, coming back to Brexit, um, There, there was a, um, a, Bryce mentioned earlier on that uh, Theresa May had um, now rejected um, the idea that the UK would leave the Council of Europe, uh, leave the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, 
that, I'm sure that's right, but the question is how temporary a reprieve that is. Um, and um, I'm by no means convinced that it's anything but a temporary reprieve. Uh, I don't think the government intends to leave the convention at the moment. Um, I think it would be uh, 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 wrong of me to say that I thought they did have, an, uh, have such an intention. But once the UK leaves the European Union, then one of the reasons for being a member of the Council of Europe um, goes away. In other words, uh, there is now, uh, under European Union law, no possibility of a state being a member of the European Union without also conforming to the European Convention on Human Rights. If you leave the, Council, if you leave the European Union, there's no longer that requirement. So um, would the UK be in the position of the colonels? I don't think so. I don't think they would be. I mean, I would like them to be in the position of the colonels in terms of international pressure, but I don't see it. I don't think that's what's going to happen. Um, and so um, I would, um, uh, let, let's imagine a scenario where indeed uh, the British Bill of Rights um, does uh, go below the minimum requirements for the European Convention on Human Rights. Um, and uh, there is then um, a, a case to Strasbourg, and Strasbourg says you're in breach of the convention. Um, then we get a, um, a, an interesting scenario whereby, uh, again, the notion of the UK having to conform to a foreign judgment comes back into play um, in an extremely febrile atmosphere, extremely unpleasant atmosphere. Um, and the notion that the UK government is just going to buckle and do what it's told, I think, is also uh, highly unlikely. It's not conforming to the judgment on prisons, uh, on prisoners' prisoners' votes. It has no intention of conforming to that. It's already, therefore, stood out against the uh, European Court of Human Rights. I don't see any reason why it wouldn't stand out again. If that then uh, launched an international controversy, um, then, for internal political reasons, I can see that the UK might well leave the European Convention on Human Rights. So I'm afraid I do see all of these sort of connected. None of this is inevitable. You know, I'm not saying there's a kind of inevitability about all of this, but there is the possibility of it. Uh, and therefore, I would be very loath um, to engage in any process um, that sought to replace um, the existing Human Rights Act. Okay, thank you very much to all our panelists. Well, our audience here, you have patiently withstood the rather erratic heating system in the room <laughs> this far. I was just wondering if you had any thoughts, reflections, or comments for our panel. Over to you. As you can see, we're all yeah. in absolute yeah. unanimity about everything. So. Yeah. <laughs> Brian, you're sitting at the back there. I'm going to now put you on the spot. <laughs> you're going to call So, um, so the argument uh, would be, in part, um, that uh, the Belfast Agreement is, uh, has, as it were, two sides to it. Um, there's the side that leads to the Northern Ireland Act uh, into domestic, litig domestic legislation. And there's the side that remains, as it were, at the international law level in terms of governing um, the uh, cross-border bodies, for example. Um, so um, there's two different dimensions to, to, the, to, to, the, uh, to the agreement. Um, with regard to the, um, um, the first part of it, the Northern Ireland Act, we're saying the Northern Ireland Act um, occupies some of the territory that the Royal Prerogative would previously have been able to um, be operational in. And therefore, since it's going to affect devolved powers specifically under the Northern Ireland Act, um, it's going to... Um, need to be done by legislation if it's going to be done at all. Second argument with regard to the international agreement um, is that an additional separate point um, is that the um, institutions of the um, British-Irish agreement, the international side of it, 
um, specifically refer, you will know better than I do, uh, to European Union law uh, and to the, uh, particularly the involvement of um, the cross-border bodies in discussing European Union law. And therefore it's going to affect those and that that needs to be factored in also as a reason uh, for why there needs to be legislation if you're going to affect um, a, a major international agreement. I'm sorry, do you want to come back on that? Mm. Um, well, it, it, it comes in in terms of uh, t two, twofold. Right? One, again, you know better than I do, that the uh, Northern Ireland Act refers extensively um, to the European Union law requirements in the, Belfast, in, in the Northern Ireland Act. And um, that, from our point of view, therefore, further is evidence of further embedment in, uh, of, of the European Union law within the Northern Ireland um, uh, Act itself. And that's another reason why the Northern Ireland Act, as it were, occupies the field and doesn't permit the royal prerogative to um, to be used without legislation affecting it, uh, authorizing it. Um, with regard to the the Convention on Human Rights, again coming back to the the point that I tried to make inadequately uh, before, um, which is the notion that the European Convention on Human Rights is also embedded as part of the agreement and in, and, and in the Northern Ireland Act itself. And therefore, we need to be conscious, the court we're suggesting uh, needs to be conscious, um, of the relationship between the Brexit and the, European Convention, the importance of the European Convention in the Northern Ireland Act. And so the question is, what's that connection? And we're suggesting that there is a crucial connection, which is that uh, the um, remedies and the substantive provisions of some of European Union law enable the European Convention on Human Rights aspects to be made more effective. In other words, uh, you can make arguments under European Union law that are crossover uh, substantive issues with the um, ECHR, like, for example, in the litigation regarding um, the blood uh, supply issue. But equally, uh, leave aside the uh, question of whether there are substantive differences or substantive co uh, um, connections there is a procedural way of using European Union law to make ECHR type arguments that will be withdrawn and affected um, if there is Brexit. So you're gonna be weakening the ECHR uh, provisions as well as withdrawing from the convention itself. And so the argument is that if you weaken one, you're therefore affecting the other, which is a central part of the uh, agreement itself. Okay. I'd like to, because I'm going to, I, you see, part of the issue is here, I, I don't usually get the, all these things in the same room together, you know, so I, I'm going to continue to abuse my position as chair of it this afternoon if you don't all mind. But it, it, what was very interesting, I think, about all three presentations, a question that seems to arise is in some, in different ways, you're all inviting the judges to put some kind of flesh on uh, human rights and equality arguments, right? So in terms of, I suppose a question that arises out of, let's say in Northern Ireland, right? In relation to the role of the judiciary here, you know, are the judges here willing to put some kind of legal flesh on the bones of our constitutional settlement? Or are those just, or not just, are those constitutional political arguments? So in a sense that a lot of the discussion seems to be inviting judges, if you like, to put some meaning, legal meaning, on some core concepts, for example, in Northern Ireland, including but not limited to human rights. Uh, I suppose the question that raises is, are the judges here willing to rise to that challenge in a sense of giving Northern Ireland constitutional law some 
distinctive meaning would be one question. But I suppose a broader question in relation to the future of human rights. There was, each of you looked at the future in specific areas or more generally in different ways, more optimistic, more pessimistic. But in terms, I suppose, of the audience here today, in terms of each of you thinking about ways forward, and even though you, you may differ on how you see the scene at the moment or what particular ways forward there might be, I suppose the question I would have is what do you think the approach should be to advancing human rights and equality and an agenda like this? So we we start, Chris, do you want to? Um, great question. So um, so in, in terms of what, what, uh, what I've been saying, um, the, the political issue and the political context is obviously wholly novel. Um, but the arguments that are being put are actually not that novel. They're actually fairly traditional um, and in some ways old-fashioned. I mean, you know, when I taught tutorials, first-year constitutional law tutorials, you had to sort of conjure up hypotheticals in order to test the foundations of the British Constitution. Yeah? And all of these hypotheticals are the, the case in front of, of the London and, and Belfast courts. And all the arguments are essentially rather old-fashioned arguments about, you know, whether the prerogative is going to be displaced, um, you know, what are the powers of the court with regard to conventions. It's first-year constitutional law. Tick, 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 tick. So um, the, the question for um, the, the court, therefore, is, um, and I'm, I'm conscious that people outside the room may well be watching this at some point, um, is whether the court is going to be willing to apply really rather old-fashioned arguments mm. in a, obviously, a novel and mm. febrile political atmosphere. Mm. And I have every confidence that, that they will. <laughs> okay. Rachel. Yep. Well, I suppose the judgment um, in the abortion judicial review showed a kind of yes but no answer to what you were asking with regards to judges' willingness. So, yes, they were willing to say our current legal framework is a breach of human rights, um, but they balked, or he balked, at going any further. So this declaration of incompatibility effectively says, you know, it's incompatible, but it's for the, the legislators to, to make the change. Um, so, I mean, it, it, that's, that's fair enough. In terms of what we do moving forward, I think this for, for women's rights more broadly and abortion rights more specifically, it's, a, it's about a kind of multifaceted approach, um, which is not just using the courts, but also making clear that there is social change within Northern Ireland because it's perceived as still being quite socially conservative. And I think that's why um, kind of civil society organisations and campaign groups and things are an extremely important part of moving the debate forward outside the legal framework, and that's um, kind of why I would encourage individuals you know, in the room to continue to be vocal about um, the importance of human rights outside women's rights context, but, and to, to make clear to Stormont and legislators that the kind of old social conservatism that kind of continues to bind us here is no longer a reflection of where so uh, our society is at. Um, and in that way, we bring about kind of incremental change. Thanks. Um, I think there is substantial evidence showing that senior judges are willing to um, be very activist in, in the constitutional field and in the human rights field. Um, shortly after, a year after the Supreme Court was set up and a few months after the 2010 election, so there was a coalition government in place, Lord Hope, the Deputy President of the Court was asked, because even then this was an issue, what would happen if the Human Rights Act were to be repealed? And he said, oh, I think the judges would come to much the same decisions under the common law as they, came, as they have been coming to under the Human Rights Act. Um, and since then, a lot of judges, our own Lord Kerr, Lord Reid, the Scottish judge, Lady Hale, have resorted to the common law um, more frequently than in the past as a means of protecting human rights. Now, I think there's a lot more to be done there. They haven't gone as far as they might have done. They haven't, for example, said that 
basic common law rights can only be uh, um, breached if there's a necessary, justifiable, um, proportionate need to do so, etc. The, the European Convention type approach, they haven't adopted that and put it into the common law. But they have um, certainly um, upheld the, the common law right of access to justice and to a fair trial to an even greater extent than um, under the European Convention, one might argue. Um, less so on free speech and freedom of access to information, etc. Arguably more so on, on equality um, in the Belmarsh case where they held that it was unlawful discrimination against uh, foreign nationals to, um, to uh, intern only them and not British people. That was possibly going beyond what the European Court would have decided because the European Court might have decided, well, that's all a, an aspect of immigration law. And if, um, if a country wants to intern you know, migrants, it's, it's entitled to do so. It might have decided that. I'm not saying it would. Can I ask a question of Chris at this point? Feel free. There's to be a great repeal bill, we're told. If in that repeal bill it says um, the European Communities Act 1972 will be repealed um, whenever negotiations with the European Union have been concluded and the government has, uh, has signed up to that agreement, is that not Parliament having its say? Would that not be the exercise of, of parliamentary sovereignty in Brexiting? It would, but that's, that's, not, that's not the issue. The, the, that's an issue, but it's not the issue that I was talking about. We're talking about the question of the triggering of Article 50 itself and the role of Parliament in that, not in the, uh, not in the repeal of the European Communities Act. And the, the reason why the distinction is important is because um, of the point that I mentioned earlier on, that um, uh, if uh, it is not possible for the European, for the UK to withdraw um, its notice under Article 50, um, then um, the UK Parliament has lost control of the issue in terms of the effect on rights. Um, because uh, it's in, it envisages, as I understand it, the Great Repeal Bill uh, envisages that um, it would come into effect um, as a result of successful negotiations, um, which the UK government would be um, a party to, but of course wouldn't control. Uh, it'll depend on what its uh, negotiating partners also are willing to agree to. So it's not as if you know the UK government is choosing a la carte um, what it's going to have. It's, it's, that's not that kind of negotiation. But, but even more importantly, if there isn't a successful negotiation, um, then the UK exits, a, exits as a matter of European Union law automatically, irrespective of whether there's a repeal of the European Communities Act or not. So the UK Parliament, again, doesn't have any say on that. Um, if you can't withdraw, then you're, you're out. And so from our point of view, then, it's the Article 50 triggering process is the critical one here. That's what Parliament should be involved in. So we could end up in a situation where the Brexit is lawful under EU law, but unlawful under UK law. Um, not fully put into effect as a result of UK law, precisely so, that the European Communities Act uh, for a time may remain. So what's the, what's the practical effect of that? Oh, the practical effect is that any uh, opportunity under EU law, for example, for, for UK citizens to go to the European Court of Justice would, would as a matter of EU law, not be possible even though technically it yeah. might be possible under um, the European Communities Act, but obviously the Court of Justice wouldn't take jurisdiction. Well, exactly. There's a paradox there. I mean, what's the point in saying... Um, well, the paradox is one way of putting it. There's a complete law. mess is the other way of putting it. Um, um, a complete mess that absolutely nobody knows uh, what is, is actually going to, to, uh, to happen. Hence the importance of getting the early process um, right because... You know, one of the points that we haven't yet fully explored between us is um, if we don't get the first stages right now and clear, absolutely clear, as to what uh, is required, then there could well be a challenge to any negotiated terms 
in the European Court of Justice in order to comply with Article 50. So the last thing I suspect that the British government would want would be a challenge at the last moment to the negotiated terms of any agreement on the basis that the proper procedure hadn't been adopted in the first place. So hence the importance of getting this done now rather than later. Could I just come back to, to can I ask uh, Bryce a question? He's all, out, he's all okay out there while we continue the conversation up here, but yes. Um, so so it's on the, it's on the um, uh, common law constitutionalism point, which I think is a really interesting mm -hmm. one. Um, so, um, I mean, we're arguing essentially common law constitutionalism, but not in a traditional rights sense. We're arguing more even more traditional constitutionalism, um, as it were. On the common law constitutionalism as a basis for rights, um, I suppose there are two points, maybe three points. One, one point is, um, up until very recently, it hasn't had a very good reputation, right? So, you know, sitting in Northern Ireland since 19, um, when was that, Queens? 1970, since 1970, common law constitutionalism never delivered uh, any kind of rights uh, jurisprudence worth speaking of in the early days in Northern Ireland when it was actually needed, none at all. All of that changed as a result of the European Convention on Human Rights, which you have eloquently spoken about. Uh, in terms of the effect of the ECHR on, on, uh, on domestic law, um, both specifically and in more, more, more general terms. So um, things seem to have changed, but they seem to have changed only under pressure from the ECHR itself affecting uh, common law. Um, if ECHR is removed, uh, you know, my pessimistic moment, uh, move at the moment would be to wonder whether any of the current uh, common law constitutionalism and rights protection would actually survive. Because I think that the courts are loyal um, followers of parliamentary sovereignty. If parliament says no, then I think eventually, whether this generation or the next generation or the generation after, will say, well, no means no. Um, we're not going to do it. Um, so I'm, we're, you know, we're, we're both guessing into the future, essentially. I, my guess would be more pessimistic. Very last point. In a funny way, the nature of British constitutionalism has changed overnight uh, in an extremely strange way. And that is that parliamentary sovereignty, which used to be the essential basis of the British constitution, overnight seems to have changed to popular sovereignty. When did that happen? Um, I, who agreed to that? Um, I, I, don't, I don't see it. So the question for the courts is going to be, in many of these situations, not are we going to adopt parliamentary sovereignty, but are we going to succumb to essentially populism um, and popular democracy of a very different kind um, that we've really never had before, so far as I know. Okay. On your first point, um, <laughs> yes, the judges could have done a lot more in Northern Ireland in the 1970s and 1980s, but let's not forget ex parte Hume in 1972. I remember it. You, you may well have, well, you were a student, I guess, at the time. Just for the benefit of the audience, if you don't know, the Divisional Court in Northern Ireland ruled that the army here had no power to disperse protesters and had never had that power since 1921. So anybody who had been required to disperse or been prosecuted for not dispersing or convicted for not dispersing could claim a miscarriage of justice going back 50 odd years. That was a pretty revolutionary decision by the, the judges of the day. Uh, the government thought of appealing it to the House of Lords, but in the end decided they wouldn't do so because they felt they might lose there as well. And so they immediately got Parliament, Parliament, the creative holder of human rights, to pass a law saying, as, as of today, the army in Northern Ireland must be deemed always to have had the power to disperse protesters in Northern Ireland from 1921. So, you know, Parliament ratified these abuses of human rights going back 50 odd years, whereas the judges had upheld them. Um, 
I could give one or two other examples, but I won't take up the time. Can, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Just as a sit Scottish citizen, what are your feelings <laughs> about the possibilities of a second referendum and the implications for what we're, what we're talking about today to, to both? I'm not a Scottish citizen. No. Um, you mean what I'm are the implications? Uh -huh. um, you know, I, th I think I think the current um, Prime Minister of uh, of Scotland uh, is a, um, a canny, wily politician um, who is uh, um, cautious, um, and when she says um, she won't go for a referendum. Um, until there is a consistent showing in the poll of 60%, uh, that seems to me an extremely sensible uh, decision to make. Um, it's clear that the announcement last week um, was meant to assure the, um, the more um, anxious of her supporters in the SNP that she was nevertheless serious about the potential for it. Um, but um, I suspect the, um, the preparation will be uh, somewhat long in coming uh, if there isn't a 60% favorable. Now, were there to be 60% favorable, um, then um, um, a referendum would have, I think, immense consequences for Northern Ireland. Um, you know, in, it is clear that in the context of the negotiations, and I'm thinking now for Northern Ireland rather than for Scotland at the moment, uh, you can, uh, I, I don't want to get involved in Scottish politics on this. Uh, in terms of Northern Ireland, um, the reconfiguration of these islands um, would be, um, I think, a very uh, dangerous moment. Um, uh, in particular, I'm conscious of, um, for example, supporters of the DUP. And um, in a, in a power-sharing Northern Ireland, um, the supporters of the DUP are um, an immensely part of the body politic. Um, so they cannot be railroaded um, into a reconfiguration that is not um, uh, one that they agree to. Otherwise, we're storing up endless problems for the future. Um, so what, would that, what that would re result in, I have no idea. Um, but I think uh, you know, those of us who are not DUP supporters um, have a responsibility not to try to push uh, particular approaches that are going to um, make that group even more uneasy than they already are. Um, equally, I think it's incumbent on um, the DUP in this kind of a scenario um, for, uh, to be extremely responsible because we are treading on eggs here. Um, the possibility of things reverting, I think, are uh, scary in the extreme. Um, uh, that's not a prediction, uh, but I think we need to be very, very careful in terms of how the next um, couple of years are evolving. And clearly the Scottish referendum plays into that uh, in ways that may or may not be helpful. Okay. Nice, did you want to? Well, just briefly, I think. Yeah. I think Nicola Sturgeon is being a wily dip diplomatic politician when raising the, the likelihood of a second referendum. I, I think she'd be very loath to trigger it, to be honest. If anything, Brexit is going to make it more likely that Sc Scotland stays within the Union, I think. I think most Scots people, more, more than, what was it, 55% last time, would say, I'd, we'd rather be in a United Kingdom outside the European Union than an independent state clamoring to get into the European Union because they're not going to get into the European Union very easily as an independent state and the um, European Union having, having suffered the Brexit is not going to make it easy for any other nation um, to break away from the Union or, or for parts of it to break away and other parts to try to stay in. I don't think that's going to be allowed. The Spanish will not allow it. Um, the Italians may not allow it. So. Um, I think uh, the union actually is, is probably safer as, regard, um, as a result of Brexit than it was before. I mean, the, the British Union, not the European Union. Which union? Not yeah. The yeah. union. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, I'd like to thank all the speakers. We started off the seminar with uh, the title of conversation about the future of uh, the UK. And just in, I think, drawing proceedings to a close this afternoon, um, before we finish, I'd just like to go to each speaker and uh, without um
uh, overplaying their prophecy. Their, their, the virtues of prophecy are what might happen in the future. And I realize that we're all, in a sense, just speculating. But just before we conclude the seminar this afternoon, for you know, no more than a minute or two each, to reflect on just their own personal thoughts on what the future of human rights might be in the UK and the years ahead. Maybe start with Bryce. I, I'm very positive and optimistic. <laughs> By nature, I am. I'm a glass half full person. Look, I'm half joking, of course. There are there are threats and, and challenges, absolutely. But um, the human rights situation in Northern Ireland is a lot better than it has been for years, than, than it's ever been. The human rights position in the UK as a whole is better than it has been for, for, for years, um, subject to those social and economic problems that are very grave that I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm I'm optimistic that. Despite Brexit, and I, like many people, were, was extremely disappointed at the Brexit vote, but I'm a political realist. Uh, we can't turn back the clock. We're not going to be able to have a second referendum and reverse the vote. That would be anti-democratic. We have to accept the result for what it is and make the best of it. Um, so um, given that, and given what's going to happen with the repeal of the Human Rights Act, I'm not I'm not glad that the repeal that the act is, is being repealed, not at all. But rather than uh, you know cry over spilt milk and be all full of doom and gloom, I think we need to make the best of it and try to make the new act as as, as good as we possibly can. When the Commission on the Bill of Rights was consulting, I mean the UK Commission on the Bill of Rights, a lot of human rights people in Britain as a whole and in Northern Ireland refused to even comment. On, on the consultation because it thought that by doing so it was somehow um, endorsing the very notion that the Human Rights Act could be repealed and, and something else put in its place. Um, a, a couple of prominent people, um, Helena Kennedy and Philip um, Sands, Sands mm -hmm. Philippe Sands, um, dissented uh, and said, you know, that this debate shouldn't even be taking place and by, by allowing it to take place we're, we're sort of um, conceding the territory. I put in a submission saying I don't want the act to be repealed but if there is to be a new act this is the, these are the additional rights I would like to go into it and try to take the, take the issue to the government and say well why wouldn't you make the National Health Service and free health care a human right? Why wouldn't you make free education a human right? Etc. Etc. That's my attitude. Rachel? I disagree with almost all of that, which, <laughs> given Bryce's experience and intellect, is making me doubt myself. <laughs> uh, I'm really pessimistic. I see it, this rise of kind of populist right, as as Chris said, across the world, as a trend towards restrictions being placed on human rights. I think the fears over migration, the refugee crisis, is giving rise to justifications for infringements of rights and liberties. I don't consider Brexit a massively democratic choice due to um, the constitu constitutional setup of the UK and also due to the vitriol and kind of misinformation that surrounded the lead up to the vote. With that said, I do see how difficult it would be, it would be to ever undo what's done. And with that said, I think it's important to strongly oppose any repealing of the Human Rights Act. I, I, I again agree with Chris that the chances of a stronger human rights framework being introduced are not in keeping with what we've seen from our government so far. So I see the future as being one that should be categorised by resistance to um, a strong trend towards impositions of rights and um, and a more isolationist and, and fearful country is to be profoundly negative at the end. <laughs> Chris? <laughs> Well, absolutely. Uh, I agree with all of that. Um, it, just two points. One point is um, that there is an interesting debate to be had um, about um, the, the democratic nature of the decision. And I'm, I'm not uh, um, uh, saying it wasn't democratic, but it was democratic in a particular way. And that was the point I was trying to make earlier on about the nature of parliamentary democracy as opposed to, or liberal democracy, as opposed to populism. I think this is a populist democratic decision. Um, 
in a context where populism and popular democratic decisions um, are so few and far between that the body politic did not know what to do with it. Um, and uh, you know, in, in no other sensible country uh, would you have such a major decision being taken on the basis of a simple majority uh, on a one-off decision uh, where um, uh, two of the major political units of the country, uh, which was meant to be, um, um, uh, after all, a, a united kingdom um, of different nations, uh, had voted against. Uh, that seems to be inconceivable, even in the context of popular democracy. So um, I'm uh, resisting the notion that it would be anti-democratic um, to call for a further referendum or indeed to uh, envisage that it might not happen. I don't see clearly what's going to happen. Um, you know, two years is a very, very long time in politics, particularly in terms of the current situation. So we'll see. More generally, um, I, mean, I spend a lot of time in England. Uh, my wife is English, my um, parents-in-law are English, my um, in-laws are English. It's very difficult not to see what is going on in the English context now um, as deeply unpleasant uh, at a, a, a pretty basic level um, in terms of the immigration uh, debate in particular, but not only. Um, and to the extent that that washes over into um, Scotland or into uh, Northern Ireland, then I think that is a dangerous uh, time. Um, and that uh, we can be infected by it um, in ways that we may not sh even share particularly. But the fact that you know, people are reading, reading the Daily Mail and the Daily Express um, in, in Northern Ireland means that they will imbibe some of this vitriol. Um, and that seems to me a, a dangerous situation. So I agree entirely with what Rachel said. In terms of way f ways forward, I think probably the one thing that we can all agree on the panel is don't put all your eggs in one basket. In other words, um, don't assume that the courts are going to be the solution. Don't, ex uh, don't assume that Parliament is going to be the solution. Um, because human rights has never survived, um, except on the basis of a pretty canny, uh, smart struggle using whatever tools are available. Um, and using whatever institutions are available. That's not going to change. Um, it may well be a, a more vicious fight. Um, it may well be a more profound fight in some ways than we've encountered before. Um, but bring it on. <laughs> okay. On that note, I'd just like to thank you all for coming along uh, this afternoon and participating in this discussion. And I suppose the key message there also is really to continue the conversation beyond today and to participate yourselves in this discussion. And obviously there are other events in the Human Rights Centre and the School of Law that we very much encourage you to participate in and attend. I think one of the great things about working in this law school and the Human Rights Centre is the great privilege of working with the colleagues who you see before me this afternoon. I very much enjoyed listening to that discussion. I think sometimes we do lack in the public square generally the sort of thoughtful, careful reflection that we've heard this afternoon. So in addition to thanking your good selves for coming along, I'd like us all to show our appreciation to our panelists for, I think, a wonderful seminar this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.